Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. All right, here we are with JQ. I'm so excited to dive in to, with Jenna here. But before we do, as always, we're going to ground and anchor into some breath. So if you're listening and you're doing anything other than being fully present, I would invite you to come back to yourself and allow this to be an opportunity to find presence. If you're driving, obviously don't close your eyes, but otherwise you can still breathe with us. So with that, JQ, for you and me and all the listeners, let's go ahead and close our eyes and just feeling your feet on the floor, your palms on your lap, and slowly through the nose, inhaling all the way up, sipping in a bit more air when you get to the top. Holding the breath here. And through the mouth, sighing it out. And through the nose, inhaling as you let the belly expand and bringing that breath all the way up. Sipping in a bit more air at the top. Holding the breath here. Maybe rolling the eyes up. Continuing to hold the breath. And audible sigh, let it go, let it go, let it go. One last one, inhaling through the nose. I need this all the time. Sipping in a bit more air at the top. Hold the breath. Roll up the eyes as if you were to look at that space in between the eyebrows. Just continuing to hold the breath here. And sighing it out. Um, you're on time flickering Whoa. Back open <laughs> yeah you almost feel different when you do that wild how that works right holy crap dude i needed that today <laughs> did you know that there's a, a night the nine do you know of the 90 second rule when i say the 90 second rule do you know what that is no. So Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor delivered a brilliant TED talk back in 2008. And her TED talk is really what made tech, TED go viral. Like her talk went viral and so did TED. So in her talk, she shared that we have a 90 second physiological response when we experience an emotion, meaning that when we feel a certain emotion that we that we feel right. It could be sadness, grief, even excitement, joy. It could be the positive ones too. The body has a 90 second physiological response, but with those quote unquote negative emotions, typically we don't want to feel those. So we don't allow ourselves to feel them and we constrict, we tighten, we contract and we block our ourselves from feeling it so what we just did here was literally just like two minutes long of just allowing ourselves to feel what what's going on in our inner landscape so fun fact wow 
<laughs> if, if that's a wow, imagine what a breathwork journey would look like. But anyways, hey, we're not here for breathwork. We're here for you, JQ. So I am so- I'm here for this. <laughs> well, you and I can go riff on breathwork a little bit afterwards. And I do have a Monday uh, podcast that is breathwork. So if you want to check it, that out or any of the listeners, every Monday we drop a new uh, breathwork exercise. Usually they're about 10 minutes long. Sometimes they range 20, but the idea is to start off the week uh, consciously and intentions and with intention. So having said that, JQ, you and I met through the promotional products industry, and I had the the pleasure of seeing you speak on stage several years back. And I'm just going to give the floor over to you to kind of share what you shared on that stage with the listeners of this podcast. I would love to. <laughs> Thank you. I actually, I can't tell you how tremendously different I feel um, after you and I just did that. I've had a really long day and I shared with you a little bit about my day and I feel happy all of a sudden. I feel uh, excited. It, it did something to me. So thank you for starting this off like that. And um, I do want to riff a little bit more on breathwork. So um, right. getting to getting into, you know, what I'm doing here um, and what I feel I'm here to, to serve others is, uh, you know, my story started in, in the promo industry in 2009. I started with Alpha Broder. I was an inside sales rep. I had no idea that 15 years later I would be running the industry sales academy and that I would be the industry sales coach. I had no idea that that's where this journey would take me. I dabbled in inside sales, outside sales, business development. And then I ended my career with AB as their senior consultant. I was running massive relationships in this industry, which is what led me to some of my greatest friendships now and really common skew. I met common skew at a customer event for one of my customers and I met Bobby and, and so on from there. And then it led me to the opportunity to speak on stage. I told a 10 minute story about surviving a mass shooting and how I translated surviving a mass shooting into my own sales perspective. And surviving a mass shooting and choosing to um, work on myself and dive into mental health uh, tools after that experience. From there, I wrote my own sales method, uh, developed my own sales academy, my own sales tools. I became a certified mental health ambassador. Um, I got recertified with my strength and conditioning coach certifications, kettlebell certifications, mobility certifications, because I just wanted to help myself. I had to help myself with my own panic attacks and my own trauma, in addition to the therapy that I was in, of course, with professionals. But for me, it became looking at that experience and acknowledging, okay, this happened. It did happen. I lost a friend that night. Um, I saw other people lose their life in front of me. I really had two choices after that experience. I could have picked the road where I could have pretended like it didn't happen and pushed everything under the rug and said, well, I'm just going back to normal, back to my daily job at Alfred Broder in sales. I have a daughter. I'm, you know, I am a daughter. I have a, a, some brothers. I was married. Imagine if I just would have pushed all of that under the rug. And I knew that I could have done that. That would have been the easy way out. Um, but I knew that I was meant for more and that there were people that needed me. I had just been promoted at Alpha the month before I went through this experience. I had a team that, that depended on me. They looked at me as a leader. So I remember October 1st was my experience. It was the Las Vegas Route 91 concert shooting. I remember sitting in Sunrise Hospital the next day. This is Monday, October 2nd. And I was sitting there with blood on me that wasn't mine. I've, you know, I've shared this before. And I remember looking down at my shoes and my shorts and the back of my arms and just feeling I really needed to get the right help if I wanted to make it out of this. And I took that path. I took the path of wanting to dive into EMDR and mental health resources and learning about panic attacks. How can I control them? How can I, how can I fight them? How can I help others? And through that, my sales perspective developed into this YOLO mentality that nothing can scare me. Going back and re-engaging a customer and asking a customer hard questions, that doesn't sound scary at all compared to what I went through. So I took that experience. I took my decision I made on Monday, October 2nd, where I said to myself, I am going to put in the work. I'm going to pick the hard path. I'm going to pick the path that requires me to put in a lot of effort to become okay. 
Um, just, I was never a big drinker, but I remember saying, I'm just going to stop drinking socially on weekends. I'm just going to be done because if I don't drink on weekends, then maybe I'll start working out on weekends. Then maybe I'll have more clarity during the week. So I did. It was something as simple as just saying, I'm not going to go out and drink with my friends anymore on the weekend. It was something as silly as that, just making that little change. And then this change happened. And then that change happened. Then I said, well, I'm going to start writing articles. I think I'm going to start writing a book. So I took this one experience, and that's what you heard me talk about on stage many years ago, and just said, how can I change my life? How can I help others change their lives? And we're here now. And, you know, I hate to say this. It was the best, worst weekend of my life. I was supposed to be there. I saved other people. I was supposed to be there. I know that I am here to lead others. I know that God is using me for that. I know he is. So I'm here to help sales reps find the best version of themselves and talk about my story and talk about how I gained resilience and self-development out of that and talk about how relationships are everything to me and talk about my strategic approach in life and sales because of that. So that's where we're at. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Like this isn't something to just gloss over. Um, what you're alluding to this mass shooting route 91 in, I believe it was 2017, right? And Jason Aldean, was he the headliner? He was. This, this was in, uh, it was in Las Vegas. And I, I believe if memory serves me correct, the shooter actually had a, a room in Mandalay Bay. Is that right? Correct. So are you okay with going back to that yeah. moment? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. going into it, obviously you never really think anything, any tragedy would happen. I said before this, I just got back from a memorial from my neighbor's um, son, who's 23 years old, and they just had a beautiful memorial for him. And he was killed in a car accident. And I mean, it's, it's always so <laughs> hard to process any of these tragedies in life and when you're going to a country concert i mean i grew up loving country and i've seen jason aldean a bunch right the last thing i would ever expect is there to be a mass shooting can you walk us through a little bit of what was going through your body when you first heard those gunshots or whatever first happened yeah we'll breathe back. our way through it we'll breathe our way through it yeah let's do it yeah. Um, yeah, I'll tell you, let me just take you back to Friday morning. That's fair. Um, Friday morning was when my girlfriend and I at the time and our friends, we left Orange County, live in Newport Beach, California. John Wayne Airport is the airport right here. And man, it was like a seven minute drive to the airport. In fact, Sam, you'll appreciate this. My car, I drove to the airport on Friday. My car was fully packed. I had a Brown and Bigelow event Monday, Monday morning. My flight leaving October 2nd, Vegas at 6 a.m., landing at John Wayne, Wayne Airport at 7 a.m. I was going to get in my car and drive right to Irvine for the Brown and Bigelow show. What could go wrong? My bags were packed, my Under Armour, my Threadfast samples. I had boxes of catalogs. Dude, I was ready to grow. All right. I was, hey, I'm going to take the six o'clock flight. They'll never know that I flew home from Vegas this morning. <laughs> hmm. So Friday morning, we get to the airport. And uh, I said to my friend, Brittany, this is going to be the best weekend of our life. I remember saying that to her that morning. And we get on the plane. Of course, mimosas are flowing. Everyone's really excited. We land in Vegas. We get to the hotel. We check in. And you do what, you know, what everyone else does. You go to change. You go to the pool. You meet new people. Order buckets of beer. You hang out. You get ready to go to the venue around 4 o'clock. We walked across the street from the hotel to the venue. There was only one entrance. One way in, one way out. We walked in and I remember night one, Brothers Osborne. Ah, love them. Brothers Osborne was on stage. And uh, I remember Brittany was standing next to me, my best friend, Brittany. And again, they were playing this song. It's called It Ain't My Fault. It's one of my favorite songs, but it's just like hardcore country song, right? People's hands were clapping. I remember looking around 22,000 people. I remember looking around and saying to Brittany, bud, this is gonna be the best weekend of our life. This is, I was, Sam, it was the coolest vibe. Day two, same thing. You get up, you go to the pool, grab some buckets of beers, you meet new people, and then you go to the venue. Same thing, right? Day three was a little different for me. It was Sunday. I said to myself, I have a flight the next morning at 6 a.m. I have to be at a show Monday morning. I'm going to play it safe today and not drink at all. And that's exactly what I did. And I can tell you it saved my life. I can tell you it saved my life. I was so present um, being sober saved my life that day, 100%. So Sunday morning, uh, FaceTimed with my daughter and 
it was a little different on Sunday because everybody wanted to get over to the event. Jason Aldean was headlining. So, you know, it made sense to uh, get there early. And if you wanted to be close to the stage, go get there. And that's exactly what we did. My cousin Monica got married on Saturday. So my cousin Russ and my cousin Cindy and her kids, they all wanted to be up close by the stage. They all wanted to be in front. So that's where we were. Um, <clears throat> when Jason Aldean came on stage, I have videos of how close I was. I have videos of him singing um, the song Old Barstool. And towards the end of the song Old Barstool was when I put my phone away. I have the video where I, you can see me sort of dropping the phone and cutting the, cutting the, the video. I remember saying to my girlfriend, did you hear that? And I remember saying it sounded like gunshots. That's exactly what it sounded like. She said, no, no, it sounds like a speaker. Other people in our group, it sounds like a speaker. Is that a firework? And I think that a lot of people were drinking. I just wasn't. I wasn't. I knew what that was. And I said, no, no, that doesn't sound right. And I knew right away what it was. And then next thing I knew, it was so quick, Sam. The crowd, it's kind of what we were like in a mosh pit, it felt like. Almost instantly after I heard that sound, the crowd started to back up, back up, back up, back up. I walked ahead. I walked, maybe it felt like 10 steps ahead because I could see that there was something on the ground and people were around something. I had a feeling it was a person. It was. I had to see it for myself to confirm what I was hearing was in fact what I thought it was. And um, it was. And within seconds, it was just a spray of bullets. Um, I ran back to my girlfriend, uh, my friend's mom who was standing next to me, my cousins, and I just clobbered people with my hands. And I said, get down. Um, I remember not knowing where the shooter was. No one knew at the time that he was Ariel. No one knew he was in Mandalay Bay. How would we know? You couldn't hear that. It sounded like he was everywhere or they were everywhere because everything was echoing. The sounds were just echoing. So when the first round hit, I was down on the ground. Um, I remember looking around. I was looking for a shooter. I was looking to figure out where should I be running right now? Where is this person? I didn't see anything other than people running for their lives, getting hurt. That's all I saw. So that's when I started to panic and say, I gotta get the fuck out of here. This is not good. Um, I pulled my girlfriend up um, and I stuffed her behind an ATM in a bar. We were probably 70 yards from the stage and to where we were, there was a catwalk where the artists could walk out and attached to the catwalk were bars and ATMs. And I found one where I could stuff her. And then I basically climbed on top of her to just think for a second. Um, I looked for a way out. And I will tell you in the moment with the ATM on the bar, this is where I was most uh, terrified. And this is where I remember thinking like, I can't get out of here. How do I get out of this? I saw people running onto the stage, uh, getting shot. I saw people just running chaotic, Sam. They didn't know where to go. And I remember saying, we're not going to get out of this. I didn't think we could. Well, how was I supposed to get out of this? So that was the moment where I accepted, well, this could be, this could be bad. So I remember just praying, just asking God, protect my little girl. She's going to probably live a life without me. You got to protect her. So I had enough time to do that. And then I saw a tent that said merchandise. Are you ready for this? I saw a tent that said VIP, beer, and merchandise. It was a white tent. And behind it was a fence. And behind that fence was the airport. And if you can think back right now and close your eyes and picture Mandalay Bay and where the Vegas airport is, there's a really big dirt patch right there. There's a very big patch of dirt where the airport is. That's what I was looking at. I was looking beyond this tent and saw a dirt patch. So I said, I gotta get over that fence and just keep running. <laughs> that was my plan, right? So I said to my girlfriend, I just need you to trust me. The next time he stops, we have to run. It's our only way out because Sam, I thought these people were in the venue. I was watching bullets ricochet, assuming they were coming from this, 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 this. I didn't know where these people were. It didn't matter where people were running, whether they were running frontwards or backwards, they were getting hit. But now I know he was up there and bullets were just bouncing to and from. 
he was in one place. But had I known that, I would have never moved. Had I known he was in Mandalay Bay, I would have just stayed between the ATM. I would have never, ever ran. So I see this tent and I see a bunch of dudes trying to, you can see that they're trying to push down this fence. And I watched them knock it down. And so the second he stopped, I grabbed my girlfriend's hand and we just took off running. Um, the gunfire started and I just told her not to stop. How I was not hit or how she was not hit is by the grace of God. And I'm so grateful for that um, because the girl running next to us, who was a bartender who ran with us, she was hit and uh, we left her. Um, so there was a lot of survivor's guilt that I have. Um, this time of year is really hard for me. We're approaching on the anniversary. So I know that I was supposed to be here. I know that, but still kind of hard, you know? So I would say that was probably the hardest moment is just being between that ATM and the bar watching going, I have nowhere to go. And then finding this merchandise tent that was in the VIP area. And I just watched these guys knock a fence down. And I said, there's our way out. I ran through a merch tent. Why? So what happened after that was I just kept running and there was a church. If you think again about that dirt patch, the next time you go back, you'll, you'll see this church. There's a church right behind the airport and behind the venue. And I saw the church and I just started shoving people behind a wall. And I would say, stay here, I'm coming back. I would go grab more. And I'd say, stay here, I'm coming back. Um, the gunfire lasted for about 11 minutes. Um, I totally heard the final shot. I heard the, his last shot. It sounded different. Um, but I didn't know that he was done after that. I had no idea. Um, but looking back, you know, had I known how this was really going to end up, I would have never ran. I risked my own life <laughs> running away from something that I didn't have to. And so just looking back at this, I just thank God every day that I, I'm okay, you know, and, um, it was just a, a, an experience that I'm so grateful for. Um, maybe who I am for sure, you know, but yeah, it was just a tough, a tough moment and would have been even tougher had I not chosen to deal with it the right way. You know, it would have been way tougher. So hopefully that helps. Jenna. Oh, my heart. Yeah, man. I, I feel you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having the courage and the bravery to share. Cause I, I know I would imagine you would resonate with this, but when we share and allow ourselves to be seen by others, it helps us, you know, in the healing process so much. Yep. And I know it's been seven years, almost at the anniversary right now. So my, what's coming up next for me is, those next few days, because yeah. I, I actually was in the room when um, I, I was one of the people that discovered my friend hanging from the ceiling fan. And I remember being at the hospital last uh, that whole night and the next few days and how that felt. So I'm curious for you. Yeah. What were those next few days like? Because you did share with us, like you knew that you had a path. I could either go, and I don't mean to be harsh when I say this, but like victim mentality and, yeah, right. and be on the effect size, for, yeah. uh, right? Yeah. How did that look for you to really l see this as a way to find gratitude and how it was setting you up for what's next? So the next few days, that's not where that came. The next few days, I made a very big mistake. I made a huge mistake within two days. Let's see, Monday was October 2nd. Uh, Tuesday was October 3rd. And I was supposed to be flying to Arizona for Alpha Broder's annual big customer golf event that we hosted every single year for our greatest relationships in Arizona. My boss, Paula Lindstrom, calls me and says, you don't have to come. I said, hey, boss, my team needs me. I'm okay. I want to I want to plow through. I got to be, be there for the team and for my customers. She goes, okay, but you don't have to. I said, no, I need to. I need to be a leader for the team. So I went. Had my first panic attack uh, the next day at happy hour. Um, there was a police helicopter that just casually flew over the resort. Um, it triggered me because there was helicopters that night. I ducked under a table. So I didn't make a good decision for myself within the next few days. Um, and it took me about a year. It took me about a year to uh, really start to make the right changes because 
just being transparent. I was in a, um, I was in a relationship with somebody who was with me that night who was choosing not to heal. So it was really hard for me to heal in the same household. Um, it was really hard for me to um, find resilience at times. And I decided to end that relationship by filing for divorce and move on with my life. And then I started to change. Mm. Then I started to have more clarity as to who I really wanted to be. Then I realized who I really wanted in my life. And then I realized who was healthy for me and my daughter, um, who was going to set a good example for me and my child, um, who was going to be no drama, who was going to share some of the same friendship, morals, and values that I might have, right? And so that's when my life started to change was when I ended a few relationships in my life. And then I found crazy clarity. I found the right relationship. I found the right friends, people that had been in my life and my cousins for all this time, but matched what I just mentioned I was looking for. I translated my entire mass shooting experience into sales perspective and life perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for yeah. me, it wasn't a few days. It took a year. Oh yeah, no, I it's never yeah. a few days. I I just yeah. was curious, like how the unfolding looked. I and in it. A, lot, a lot of ways for me, like I could say that the the hanging, the suicide, like that summer working with uh, kids in South Lake Tahoe was very healing. But then also, like years later, once I finally started to do the spiritual work in this deep work, like then I've gone back and revisited that. So. Well, quotes coming through for me. Uh, I first heard this quote from James, James Whitaker. That's his name. And the quote is, hang out with people with a common future, not a common past. Ah. And I love this quote so much because probably similar for you around that time period. It, I, I can speak for myself and you feel free to jump in. But I know once I started intentionally doing the healing work and seeing the people around me that were, yeah, they are my friends and they had the best intention and whatever else, it wasn't for my highest and best good. And it the quote, hang out with people with a common future, not a common past. It's about honoring the people in the past because a lot of people will hear that and they'll be like, oh, you don't want to just burn bridges. And it's like, well, no, like we're not discounting them or thinking we're better than them. It's right. to your point, finding gratitude and looking at where I'm moving forward. You know, Sam, it, that's exactly, um, that's exactly it is I knew where I was going in life and I knew for me to heal and for me to be okay after what I had gone through that I really needed to be more cautious about who was in my life, who was around me, who was around my child um, it was, it took me a year to get there. And for, even though I had made that decision, October 2nd, I'm going to pick the hard path. I thought going to Arizona and being a leader was me doing the right thing. And it wasn't. So for a year, I, I didn't make decisions that were really the right choice for me to heal. I drained myself, you know, I put myself in, in four situations with friends and, and a partner that it really delayed my healing. And so once I just realized I, for me to get here, you got to go. And I made that decision and I am living my dream life. I'm, I'm, I'm living a life that I never imagined. You know, I, I, at one point before route 91, at one point I was surrounded by people. I remember wanting to do this fitness challenge called 75 hard. Mm -hmm. I had my partner and friends in my life that were upset that I was doing it. You know why? What do you mean? You're not going to drink with us? What do you mean? 75 days of no drinking? Are you serious? And I was like, wow, guys, way to be fucking supportive. Now I have people in my life that are like, wait, I'll do it with you. Yeah. It's different now. I, I, I found myself. I found, yeah, yeah. Such a good metaphor. And one of my mentors, he talks about crabs in a boiling pot water. If one of the crabs tries to get out, the other crabs will pull them down. And that's kind of like mm. what our psyche goes to as humans, you know? I felt that. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly, exactly what I felt. And after this experience, I was with those same people in life. And I thought, well, if I'm trying to heal, you're, you're pulling me back in the pot. I got to go. You can stay in the pot though. I'm out. 
Bye. Yeah. So when you said, okay, I got to go, I'm getting out of this pot boiling water. I'm doing 75 hard. You, you won't stay drinking all of that. What sort of support and tools started to come? into your awareness because you mentioned emdr but like how did you actually go about your healing journey what did that look like yeah so um i don't know who but somebody that i helped the night of route 91 reported me to the state of nevada as somebody that helped them and i received 40 free um counseling sessions from the state of nevada so i blew through those in um like months i i use them sometimes three a week I needed it. I was not okay for, for a while after um, what had happened. Um, we're quick cl there. clarifying question. Were you working with this counselor in the first year or not till after that first year? I started working with this counselor uh, probably 30 days after Route 91. Got it. Okay. 30 days after. And I was not allowing myself to fully, I guess, do the work. Let's call it that. I was I was there and I was believing in it, but because mm. I was too afraid to make changes in my life, I didn't execute. Make sense? Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Wow, I never said that to anyone else before. Shit. How, how um, does that feel? It feels good. Do you want to know what this reminds me of with you? Yeah. You've seen the movie Jerry Maguire, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know where Larry King is talking to Rod Tidwell and he says, you're not going to make me cry. You're not going to give me <laughs> He's like, damn it, you got me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll take being uh, referenced as Larry King. Sure, why not? And, uh, you can tell me, show me the money all day. I'm down like, for that. Damn it, yeah. you got me. Yeah, how does it feel? <laughs> damn it, Sam. Yeah, no, it, felt, it, feels good. it feels good to talk about this because we can help other people with this, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And and what, I, what I'm getting at here too is like, there healing is not linear right you know it's not like oh what'd you do the next day the next few days or the year after or now that seven years later but it's interesting to hear how when you do that trust fall into just having unwavering faith like you did like filing for divorce and moving forward being like i need to protect my daughter i need to protect my own mental health and i'm going to trust how did things just unfold from there, like in ways that you cannot explain? Like, I'm sure there are some miracles there. Okay. I'm, I've never talked about this publicly and I don't know how this is going to go, but I don't know how to answer the question without being fully transparent. I ended a marriage. I ended a relationship with um, my best friend of 25 years. I removed her from my life at the same time I removed my wife from my life. And I ended a relationship with a family member. Hmm. And I ended those relationships because they were the crabs pulling me back in the pot. It was instant the second I removed them from my life. It was instant clarity to the point where I said, ta-da, this feels great. I had people in my life that did not want me to climb out of the pot because they didn't want to climb out of the pot. So I can't put my finger on it for you on when it was. I mm. think it was almost instant. I couldn't stay there with you guys. I can't sit there on October 1st and drink with you guys anymore and cry. I'm going to go for a hike. I'm not going to drink that day. I'm going to go for a hike. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to go hang out with my dad that day. It was instant, man. Mm -hmm. It's incredible, right? Yes. It was yeah. instant. Yeah. Yeah. It was instant. It's, as soon as we make that decision, we'll be supported. So as, as you start to go down this path, actually, before I go there, um, so victim mentality, let's talk about this for a moment, because you have, it's very understandable for yourself or anyone in that situation or, or one of the traumas I shared earlier, right? Or for anyone listening to experience something that is just inexplicable, to get into this state of victim mentality without uh, uh, just being straight up, right? Victim mentality, like why do bad things happen to good people? Why is my life suck? Why is this happening to me, uh, right? It's so easy to go there. What advice would you have for people so that they can really lean into it and realize and see for themselves that they do have the power and that everything is unfolding for them as opposed to to them. 
Yeah. And I don't know if this is the right answer, but for me, it was going through something that was so incredibly scary. It was that moment between the ATM and the bar. That was my scariest. That was the scariest moment of my life. To this day, I've never been more petrified. In fact, I peed myself that night. I, I, I did. And I only realized that in the next morning, October 2nd, I, I realized that I had. I didn't know that night that I had, but I did. I was so scared, man. You have no idea. And so for me, it was what could be more scarier than thinking there's going to be a gun in your face at any moment or thinking that you're going to be killed and your poor kid has to go live her life without you. There's nothing scarier than that. So for me, I realized it was an easy answer. If I want to go live this life, I have to make these changes. Life is short. I've seen people lose their life right in front of me. Parents, husbands and wives, I watched it happen. For me, my advice is YOLO. I know that sounds silly, but it's not. Just go do it. If you're daydreaming about it, go do it. If it's crossed your mind, go do it. Just do it. For me, I know this sounds wild. I was daydreaming about cutting people out of my life. I was daydreaming about what a life without them would look like. I could do this. I could go do this fitness competition. I wouldn't, I would feel supported here. I could lean into this friendship more. I could get healthier. I don't have to drink every weekend. I started daydreaming about the life I wanted. And then I realized, well, it's not so scary to go make that change. Nothing is as scary as being between that ATM and the bar. What am I scared mm. for? Just go do it. So that's my advice is, guys, we cannot be scared to make the changes or go after what we want. Nothing scares me anymore. Nothing. And so that is why my sales perspective and my sales method is so intense. My sales method requires sales reps to take advantage of every encounter they have, to leverage every connection they have and every relationship by asking hard, direct, invasive questions. And sales reps say, Jenna, that's so scary. I can't ask customers that. Okay, then just don't. But watch what happens when you do. So my answer is, if you are at all thinking about a life that you want to live, you're daydreaming about anything you want to go accomplish, just go do it. Literally, you never know what's around the corner. And so making it out of that mass shooting, I promised myself, no one's going to waste my time ever again. You mm. can't. So I ended my marriage. I ended a friendship. I ended a relationship with a cousin who I realized all three of you are not serving my kid or me. This is not healthy for me. I don't want to stay in this place. I want to go move on and I want to go serve other people with my story. So for me, it just came down to, I wanted something. I just made it happen. I didn't daydream about it because I watched other people get shot literally in front of me. Why would I sit and waste my time? If they were here, they'd be like, go fucking get after it. So I'm going to go get after it. That's my mm. advice. Just go do it. I love that clarity. I, I love it. And the passion behind that. It, it, you're right. You're totally right. I think a, a most people are daydreaming. I think most people know what they want. They It's not a matter of not knowing what they want. It's the taking action piece. And with the taking, taking action piece, it's the next step, next step, next step. Like how do you eat an elephant? If there's a reason to eat an elephant, but if you would, it's one by at a time, right? So one step after the next. Now you mentioned asking hard questions in sales. To me, I'm like, man, how how hard could be that question be? So what 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 is like one of the more direct hard <laughs> questions that you say to ask in a sales conversation? Because I'm super curious at this point. <laughs> I'll give you a few. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have experience on both sides of the business. I have been a supplier, I've been a distributor, and I did really well when I was a distributor. And I learned, you know, very quickly, the way to scale any relationship is just re-engaging with hard, direct, invasive, sometimes nosy questions to really vet out the relationship and protect yourself from jumping into anything that's not great for you. But also just figuring out how do I evolve this time after time? I have to get to know you. I have to profile you. So I'm going to ask you some hard, direct, invasive questions. I'll tell you a question I asked a customer this morning. You should have seen the look on her face, but she answered it. I said, Robin, what business of yours is HPG just not getting? 
<laughs> she told me tons of stuff, right? She just rambled on and she said, no one's ever asked this of me before. I can't believe that you asked me this. Were you really nervous to ask me that? And I said, no, I wasn't because I have to know. I had this conversation this morning in field training. So that's one question I would ask customers, whether I was an end uh, distributor or not. What business of yours am I just not getting? Uh, another question I would ask end users when I was a distributor is, hey, I know this might be a hard question, but I have to ask it. It's going to allow me to serve you the way that I want to. What's your marketing budget look like for the remainder of the year? That's a hard one. I got a lot of answers on that. Um, another one that I loved asking when it came to large projects, really large projects that I knew that I wanted to win. I would ask something like, hey, is there anything about this project that I don't know that I should? Or are there any roadblocks in this project that you've hit that I should know about? I was just being really, really direct. And some sales reps, they come back and say, well, are you sure they won't get mad if I go back and ask that? I don't know. Try it. Those are just some of the direct approaches I've taken when it comes to nurturing the relationship. But I don't think there's any problem with asking customers straight out, where do you feel I have the most opportunity to grow with you the remainder of the year? Why not? No, I don't think so either at all. I, I think on the surface, these questions aren't scary, but then like if you're not- in sales at all, it's like, okay, there is a little bit of a resistance there. But when we compare it to Route 91 and your story, it's like, yeah, it's not scary at all. And I, I, I love your approach to sales. Talk with us a little bit about how you became so passionate in what you're doing now with your sales academy. Yeah, sure. So uh, three years ago, I was given the opportunity to take on a VP role of, of a supplier, a retail brand in the industry. And, you know, knowing I had all these relationships over the last 15 years, I knew that that wasn't going to guarantee units. That wasn't going to guarantee orders for me. So I remember saying to myself, I wonder what would happen if I offered free sales coaching and I offered to help my distributor customers grow their business. Maybe then I would form other relationships and move product. So Sam, that's exactly how this started was Mm -hmm. I took an approach to coach sales reps I didn't need to talk about NOS product. I didn't really want to. I wanted to talk about you. Let's talk about your business. Let's talk about your clients. Let's talk about your pain points. What part of the sales process do you find least enjoyable? Where do you spend too much time in your day? What's holding you? You get it, right? And I Mm -hmm. found a passion for serving sales reps because I have 11 years of strong fitness industry experience before I ever came into promo. I was a personal trainer for 11 years. And then before that, I had a passion for law enforcement and I went through the LAPD hiring process. So I've always had a passion to serve. I've always had a passion to protect. I've always had a passion to help others. And just, I love communication. I love people. And after what I went through, relationships are everything to me. So the fact that I got to spend all day with sales coach or sales reps and coach them and serve them fills my bucket every day. But I never, if you would have asked me three years ago, what do you think you'll be doing? And I would have never said, well, I'm going to be an online sales coach, a global sales coach. I'm going to have my own sales method. I'm going to have my own academy. I would have never imagined this happened out of nowhere. And so, yeah, go ahead. Oh no. And so go ahead. No, it was just, it was, it was the, the most beautiful accident in my life to come up with my own sales academy. Cause what was happening is these one-on-one coaching meetings People were coming back and saying, can I meet with you again next week? Can I meet with you again the next week? And then I started to see this consecutive sequence of how it was serving others. So then I put together a curriculum. I'm teaching basic negotiation. I'm teaching persuasive communication tactics. I'm teaching recovery maneuvers, what to do after you've lost a client. And I'm pairing my law enforcement experience. I'm pairing my fitness industry experience with this academy. And so the importance is it's changing people's lives. It's changed mine. I love the framework around it too. Like anytime I've seen your branding or hear you talk about it as well, like you're covering all the bases and it's really needed, not just in the promotional products industry, but across the board. And a lot of the listeners of this podcast, a lot of people are like, you know, 
first time entrepreneurs or trying out side hustles and sales, uh, there's a certain finesse there, right? Um, but one of the things I was going to mention was one of my homies, George Bryan, he talks about how relationships beat algorithms. And I've heard you say relationships quite a bit. And I love that you're so focused on building relationships because sales gets a bad rap because they're, we think of like a sleazy car salesman or a typical salesman, right? And it's like sleazy and dirty and doesn't feel good. Or maybe we have some money trauma or money stories that are holding us back there. But at the end of the day, it really truly is all about relationships. How do you feel that we can infuse more mental health in business culture, taking sales specifically out of it, but business culture in general is very transactional based. What do you think that we can do to infuse more? Hey, let's connect with each other into it. Yeah. I mean, follow my sales method. My sales method, I call it field sales method. It's a lifestyle. It's all about nurturing connections. It's all about scaling relationships by asking direct, challenging, sometimes invasive questions. And this approach, my approach, will ensure realistic opportunities and it will prevent sales slumps. So to your point, there is a lot of transactional BS happening because sales reps are not doing a few things. They're not prospecting. They're not doing their research. They're not doing their discovery. They're not vetting anything out. They're living in a constant state of presenting, presenting, and doing this. Hmm. Well, I wish and hope they come back. Oh, I'll present again. I'll more, more spec samples. There's no habit to re-engage. There's no trigger to go back and re-engage whether you win or lose and ask challenging direct questions. So I think if there was a more consultive approach with more empathy, less sales managers, more sales leaders, that that would probably change things. Hmm. I think sales reps are too afraid to ask hard, challenging, invasive questions. I think sales reps feel that they don't have enough time to prospect. I think sales reps have the wrong idea about what prospecting is. I think a lot of people think it's outreach. It's not. It's preparation. It's uh, strategizing. It's assessing. It's planning. It's all of those things. That's where people get hung up. So after my experience with Route 91, I walked away saying, Prospecting to me is just nurturing my relationships. And I'm going to do that by re-engaging them and asking them really hard, direct, invasive questions. I can tell you as a distributor sales rep with my three massive end user clients, that's all I did was re-engage. I created my own re-engagement formula. I was constantly going back when my competitors were just not. They were living in this place of sampling and waiting and wishing and hoping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Amazing. they were probably re-engaging with product and I was re-engaging with hard questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, going back to the promotional products industry, the industry I come from, like, yeah, it's so easy to get so centered and into products. And hey, I mean, that's how I built my brand and built my business, uh, Swag Sam and getting all, I mean, literally, we would interview movers and shakers uh, in Silicon Valley on the podcast, What Up Silicon Valley, bring a bunch of brand stuff and they'd literally be like, why don't we buy our swag from you? And I'm like, I don't know. Why don't you? <laughs> you know, it was a very easy approach. But um, anyways, though, I Jenna, I just want to honor you and say thank you very much for sharing your story. I know that's not easy. I see how how dedicated you are to your craft of sales and also infusing mental health. And to me, you know, that's what is so important. So I love to see that so much. One final question for you as it relates to more of the, the healing mental health side of everything we've been talking about with Route 91. You mentioned in the first few days after the experience uh, going to a, I think it was golf tournament and you heard an airplane and that was a trigger point. Here we are seven years later, when you hear loud noises or anything that is giving you that sensory trigger activation, how are you handling that now? Yeah, great question. Because I've put, uh, let's see, it's almost seven years, because I've put almost seven years of work into EMDR um, and also therapy, I should also tell you this. I partnered with two trauma experts on my sales academy, mm. and they both have given their stamp of approval that this sales academy that I'm conducting will have benefits and does have benefits for folks outside of sales. And I'm actually working with one of them right now to get this into um, 
other other hands besides sales reps um, for trauma healing as well. So um, it was seven years of me going through EMDR to get to the point where dogs barking, sirens, helicopters don't affect me anymore. Um, for a good, it feels like it was probably about a year, if I'm being honest with you. And I kind of am embarrassed to say this, but I guess not really. I can't even walk my dog outside. I had to, I'd have neighbors walk my dog. Um, if my girlfriend wasn't home, cause I could not walk outside at night and where I live, there was buildings. I couldn't do it. I can walk outside now, but I will tell you where my issues still are is buildings, cities, uh, outdoor concerts. I don't go to them. Um, Anywhere where there are people behind me, um, above me that I can't see, I don't do it. Going to Nashville for, for events, I don't walk on that street. I can't do it yet. One day I will, but I'm still Wait, having a Why Nashville? Because all those buildings. I just remember I was oh, in God. Nashville. When I, had, I had a massive panic attack in Nashville uh, about two years ago. And I didn't understand why. And then I remember looking around going, I know why. There are people on buildings and it made me scared. And country so music everywhere. So that's what I'm... There you go. And yeah. Jason Aldean's bars there. So I am working on walking with buildings. I'm working on um, going to movie theaters still. Yeah, there's still some areas that are hard for me, but helicopters were good. Sirens were good. Dogs barking were good. Amazing. So EMDR was the one for you. So uh, for anyone listening that hasn't heard of e EMDR, could you explain that real quick? I mean, I'm not a professional, but for well, me- Just your experience yeah, of it. Yeah. yeah. EMDR professionals, they do not want to talk about the experience with you. They'll actually stop you from talking about it because they don't need to re-trigger you. EMDR for me was clearing out the trauma, clearing out the trauma. So for me, it was going back to the moment that I heard the dogs barking. For me, it was going back to the moment that I heard the helicopter, going back to the moment that I heard the sirens and clearing that trauma out. A lot of times EMDR can lead to other areas of trauma that also will be cleared out and for me it was extreme it was just wonderful emdr is wonderful for trauma 100 i cannot say enough for it amazing it's Stand not talk cool. therapy it's just yeah. not yeah it's awesome. yeah you know i'm doing a nlp training right now which is kind of similar it's in so terms cool. of getting straight to the root i mean a lot obviously i go deep with psychedelics and one of the being toad mess and bufo and that's another one where you don't need to relive it um because in an ayahuasca ceremony if something's coming up you better surrender to it because you're gonna have to see it every which way until you surrender to it which is the nice thing about working with something like emdr or uh, yeah. any form of oh, hypnosis yeah. qhht or even bufo so anyways jenna thank you so much for coming on the pod i appreciate how you're showing up in the world how can people best connect with you instagram uh just my name jenna peranta it's the easiest way to catch me i'm on linkedin as well best way to catch me for sure amazing i'll have it linked in the show notes jenna thank you again we'll talk soon thanks sam